Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to Higher Ed Live, the first Higher Ed Live of 2014, and this is Admissions Live, the weekly web show for college admissions professionals. We broadcast on the Higher Ed Live network, a product of Eduverse Media. Tune into Admissions Live on Monday afternoons at 1 p.m. Eastern on higheredlive.com, and join in the conversation, of course, on Twitter using the hashtag Higher Ed Live, and we will check that throughout the show. I'm your host, Chris Dorso, new for 2014, uh, and, I, and today I am joined by David Hawkins. David is the Director of Public Policy and Research for the National Association of College Admissions Counseling. And in just a minute, we'll be chatting about the state of college admissions in 2014. It's become something of an annual kick-off-the-year kind of a topic for us here at Admissions Live. But we can't do that without first giving a shout-out to the sponsors who make Admissions Live possible every week. Uh, first, uh, Zinch is a service of Chegg that helps colleges and universities save time and money while connecting with best fit students throughout their college search. Zinch partners save up to 90% of the recruitment cost of generating a single enrollment for their institution while putting students first in their recruitment outreach. Email outreach at zinch.com or tweet at social admission to get in touch with your institution's dedicated Zinch representative today. Uh, and also a note from our friends at Zinch, uh, if any of you out on the West Coast who are um, uh, attending the Western Region Color College Board Forum in Santa Clara later this month, uh, the Chegg team and Zinch uh, invite you to a special reception and guest speaker at their offices, which is right across the street. Uh, space is limited, so RSVP today, uh, and we will tweet that uh, link out to you uh, from uh, the Higher Ed Live uh, feed, so make sure that you are on top of that if you're out in the West Coast uh, at the end of this month. Admissions Live is also sponsored by Welcome to College, where college visits are made simple. The mission at Welcome to College is to help, fi uh, help students find colleges where they'll flourish. The team at Welcome to College believes it's all in the visit, as do I, and they have created free web and mobile applications to plan, rate, share, and compare the entire college visit process. Parents and high school counselors can also create an account to share their impressions, so check out Welcome to College Today. All right, so uh, as the calendar turns to 2014, uh, enrollment offices around the country are starting to kick into overdrive. Uh, we are all busy reading and reading and reading and reading, pretty much. Uh, and so let's take some time off from all that reading to talk a little bit about what's happening around the country. Uh, and with that, I would like to bring in uh, the Director of Public Policy and Research at NACAC, uh, David Hawkins. So David, welcome. Yeah, thank you, Chris. So uh, tell us a little bit, uh, David, about what the State of College Admissions Report is uh, and how we can get our hands on it. Well, Chris, thank you. The, the State of College Admission Report um, is NACAC's way of telling the story of the admission process uh, to anyone who isn't working in the field. Uh, when I took over research here at NACAC a little more than a decade ago, I realized that uh, our members, our counselors and our admission officers work in a very unique uh, environment. Um, that there's a lot of scrutiny, there's a lot of angst around this environment, and of course our professionals feel it. And when you go to a NACAC conference, uh, you do get the sense that we're working in a professional community that uh, I imagine like any, any community uh, can be misunderstood by the, by the public and, and anyone else who's watching. Um, so you tended to hear a lot about, you know, I wish we could just tell the story. Um, and as, when I took over research, I saw that NACAC didn't have an annual report on, on admission trends. Um, and it's something that uh, I often th think about in terms of various markets for information uh, that, we were, that we were missing. Uh, when I think of, for instance, the weddings industry, uh, there's a different crop of people getting married every year. Uh, and, and really, I, I can't imagine the, the process of planning weddings and, and, and getting all of that in, uh, in, in line. I can't imagine that changes radically from year to year, but nonetheless, you have a new crop of people coming through, and that's much like the college admission process, uh, and particularly uh, for students and families, but also for people like college administrators and high school principals. Oftentimes, they see parts of the elephant, so to speak. Uh, they experience one piece at a time. And what I hope to do and what NACAC hopes to do with this report is really put the whole elephant together uh, so that everybody can kind of see the process. Because it makes a lot more sense, I think, and I'm speaking now as just someone who went through college admission back in the, in the Ice Age or some, somewhere around there, um, that um, 
that when you're going through it, it's a lot more difficult to see the whole picture. So we hoped that this report would be uh, a way to tell that story, a way to orient people to the process so that it's a little bit less mysterious as they get into it. And where you can find this report, of course, is on our NACAG website. Um, you just look for the Research tab. Um, and, and click on the Research tab, you'll see NACAC Research, and the State of College Admission is right in there. Uh, free for our members, um, and available for a small fee for, for those who aren't members. Um, and one thing I should mention before we get going into the findings is that this year's report is a little bit delayed. I should say the 2013 report, because of a techn technological uh, snafu we had here at NACAC that set us back a while, but we are just about ready to release it, and I'm glad to say that today's broadcast is really the first information that we've put out uh, about the current year's report. So, um, so that's, that's it in a nutshell. Wow, so this is like really behind-the-scenes world premiere information. That's right. Exactly. It's a world premiere. Yeah, not bad. <laughs> All right, so, so what kinds of key findings here? What, what, what have we got that, we, that the world needs to know about? Well, you know, like I said, we try to paint a picture for the, for the folks who, who need to know this information. And, of course, students and families are a big audience. Because our professionals also serve students and families, they're really the front lines. We want the professionals to see this whole picture. Um, and then also, uh, like I said, college administrators um, and high school principals often don't understand the admission process or the counseling process. So we want to look at sort of uh, the whole landscape. And what we see in 2013 um, and, and the way in which we structure the report is we look at the environment, uh, the context in which admissions happens, so the flow of students through the pipeline. And when I talk about admissions, um, we are largely talking about the four-year traditional college experience here. We, you know, there is a lot more to college enrollment than this, but this is our niche and this is where we are right now. So we look at the context, the pipeline. We also look at uh, what I had called the funnel. Um, you had, you had uh, I think, very astutely uh, asked if the funnel, in fact, was still alive. Uh, well, that's so one perhaps of the, it's one better. Of the it's, great questions that we come up with all the time is, well, because well, it used to be, you know, when again back in the Stone Age, you know, we'd fill out the forms or we get the book, and you you get this set of prospects, and then you'd whittle that down to uh, to inquiries, and then to applications, and then to admits. And you know, is the funnel still there? And what does it look like in 2014? Right. A whole separate issue, maybe. But I'll let right. you finish. That's a, that's a, as you said. That's that could be a whole other uh, webcast. Perhaps yeah. we describe it as a colander or a uh, um, uh, some sort of a, of a corral with no fences. But anyway, um, <laughs> we we look at that. Um, we also looked uh, this year particularly. We were interested in in uh, technology and recruitment strategies. So I think that might be of interest to this audience. Um, we look at admission strategies such as early decision, early action, and wait lists. And then we look at the factors in the admission decision. So I'll go through those briefly um, so that I can give you a flavor of what we found in 2013 and maybe point to some of the larger indicators that we've seen. Uh, now, in terms of the environment, in terms of the pipeline, uh, I think we've all been pretty familiar with the population uh, growth, uh, the fact that just about two or three, you know, oh, wait a minute, it's 2014. Now I'm, I'm, I'm dating myself. <laughs> About five years ago, we, we reached a, a record uh, number of, of high school graduates in the U.S. Um, and a lot of the media that call me now ask me, well, now that we're on the decline, what does that mean for colleges and universities? And I think that always has to be tempered. And one thing we point out in our, in our uh, report is that while there has been a slight decline uh, in, in the population of high school graduates, we're still, I, I like to call it sort of a plateau, we're still at a level that exceeds any previous era uh, in, in our relatively short history of mass college admission in the U.S. So even though we are on a slight decline, it's really not something uh, that I think is so drastic as it was, say, back in the 1980s and 1990s, where we experienced double-digit declines, like 12 to 15 percent down over about an 8 to 10 year period. Right now we're looking at about a 1 to 2 percent decline over the, over the period between 2009 and 2017. Um, of course, oh, sorry, sorry, Chris, you were going to say something. Does, does the international piece play into that as sort of helping make up that difference, if you will? I mean, you talk about the growth and, and what, and we've certainly seen it on, on, on the micro level here, but does the international piece play into that, or is that sort of outside the scope of what you're looking at? No, I think the international piece plays into it. It's not something we cover in the report, uh, mainly because the Open Doors report from IIE and the State Department uh, pays so much attention to international enrollment. But certainly, when you look at the international enrollment um, charts over the last decade, you see a very steady increase. And I think 
probably more than uh, population uh, infill, so to speak. Um, budget infill is, is, is the primary driver for international student recruitment. Um, I think we've seen in, in other data, including last year's, I should point out that last year's report, or I should say the 2012 report, was a 10-year trend report where we actually compiled 10 years worth of data and put it in. There you can really see some of the trends, um, you know, pertaining to uh, things like gapping students uh, in financial aid. Uh, you can see that it's getting harder and harder for colleges to really provide the kind of, I guess, the financial package that students need domestically, uh, and are looking at, as we cover in the in 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 our report every year, uh, are looking at such an unpredictable um, uh, incoming class every year that uh, you know there has to be some cushion for from a budgetary standpoint. Um, so, so you know, as we look at these these trends, uh, one trend that we're likely to hear about is the fact that uh, for the first year since 1995, there was actually a decrease uh, in college enrollment in the U.S. Um, and I think everything we'd heard before is that there was just going to be sort of never-ending increases in enrollment. But really, when you dig into those numbers, uh, you see sort of where the the shrinkage was. You, the the public four-year colleges and the private Nonprofit four-year colleges both grew during the last year, but you know, by I think if I if I recall correctly, the private nonprofits went up about seventy-six thousand uh, in one year. The public uh, four years uh, went up one hundred twenty-three thousand. So there were there were gains in the NACAC sort of traditional membership space. Where where we saw a drop off, interestingly enough, was in two-year public colleges, so community colleges, uh, to the tune of about one hundred fifty-five thousand. Uh, maybe we attribute that to the workforce getting stronger, or the, the economy getting stronger, and people not necessarily feeling the need to go back to community college. Uh, we also saw in, in the private for-profit sector a drop of about 62,000 students in one year, and I think for some of the same reasons as the community colleges, but also some of the unique uh, problems that the for-profits have been involved in, uh, we've seen a decline there. Uh, so again, when, when we think about the backdrop, we're thinking still a fairly sizable number of, of, uh, of students out there that we're recruiting. Um, and I think that gets us into the next subject of the, so the applications, acceptances, and yield. Um, a lot of reporters will call me and say, why are colleges struggling? Why are they, if, if there's so many students out there, why are they working so hard? Why are they you know, struggling to enroll students? And in that case, I always point to the yield issue. Um, and that, you know that starts to sound like some sort of a government, uh, you know, uh, uh, mantra or some sort of code code speak for you know the the, uh, the yield issue. What are we going to do about that? Well, you know, over the last ten years, we have absolutely seen a, a, an exponential increase in the number of applications that have been coming into colleges. That sort of parallels with the rise of online applications. Um, and what we've seen across the board, and this this is not any particular set of colleges out there is just yield that's been falling through the basement floor. I mean, we about 10 years ago when we measured yield, it, it, it was about nationally, we, we looked at an average yield rate of about 48.7%. Um, and in our, in our most recent data, and I'm going to flip through some pages here to make sure I get you the right number, uh, in our most, most recent data, uh, the average yield rate nationally was 36.9. So we're looking at um, you know, a good 14 uh, or so points drop if you round up, or, or 13, to, or a double digit decline in yield uh, across the board. And um, I think that really points to the instability in the, in the application market, uh, for, for lack of a better word. Um, well, I think and that's so a, I think you ask, I think it's a really interesting point to like that. Because I think sorry to, to interrupt, but the um, the the sort of the, the science of what we do, um, it's it's and again, I'm speaking on the micro level here. Uh, it's it's really it's pretty scientific when we look at you know our our application pool and and how we admit students and and the the numbers of students that we admit. Um, we generally know from year to year on the the overall over our application pool what kind of a yield number we're going to get and it's it's really interesting to see that sort of national perspective that uh, that sort of chaos in the works that you know you look at you talk about not knowing how this works from the inside the public seeing that panic uh, on our side without uh, without realizing how the numbers work interesting right right and that's I think that's part of the description the part of the narrative that we want to try to get out to the public uh, because most people, I think, come into the process thinking, well, 
my grades and my test scores will, will get me in. And to a large extent, they're right. I mean, when we look at the factors in the admission decision, which is probably our most popular bit of, of research that comes out of this report, your, your, your grades, particularly in, in college preparatory classes, um, standardized test scores, uh, your overall GPA, uh, those are the most important factors. I mean, there is no, no question about it. Um, but as, as many admission deans have told me over the years, I could, you know, they, uh, speak, they, speaking in the first person, say I could throw out all of our accepted students, or all of the enrolled students, rather, and bring the next batch in from, that we didn't accept. Uh, and they would be almost equally qualified to, to enroll here. So the, 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 the issue of, of um, you know, communicating to students and families then why your son or daughter might not have gotten accepted to a college becomes much more difficult, and I think, unfortunately, there are admission officers who may just find it easier to say, well, their test scores weren't good enough, or you know, their GPA just wasn't quite there. And that, that might be true in some instances, but it's so much harder to say, well, let me tell you a little bit about yield. You know, do you have, do you have a few hours? Um, <laughs> so, so we try to get this story out there, and we try to, to stress that this, is all, this, is, this all goes into the issue of fit. And I think that when we look at some of the strategies that colleges use. You know, we look at early decision, we look at early action, uh, we look at wait lists. When we describe all of these things, when we describe the factors in the admission decision and why in the world a college would be interested in whether a student is truly interested in attending, you know, the, the issue of uh, measuring a student's demonstrated interest in attending, um, we try to paint it in that larger picture. We try to say, look, this is a sort of a delicate dance, and if yield has been on the one hand, dropping over the last 10 years, and on the other hand, uh, less sort of predictable from, from college to college, you know, they're, sort of, they're, they're groping around in the dark almost as much as the students are. So when, when the students can extend a hand and the colleges are trying to find a hand, then you know, that, that, that makes some sense to, to parents and families, or, or students and families. Um, one interesting thing that um, that we measure in our factors in the admission decision is, like I said, the relative importance of the various credentials that students bring to the table. And obviously grades, particularly in rigorous curriculum, are always, always, always number one. Uh, now I, ha I had the pleasure of sitting in on a, um, uh, a high school course scheduling uh, meeting that, that, that the, the counselors at my son's middle school put on for the eighth grade eighth graders and their families, and, and disappointingly there were only about 40 of us there. Uh, but I was amazed at how quickly the conversation turned from discovering all the wonderful options that the, the local high schools offered in terms of coursework to, yes, but how does this reflect on my child's chances to get into a top college? So right there, I, you know, my, 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 my applied knowledge from this job was, was instantly put into use. What alarmed me the most, and which I think, what I think is one of the most um, valuable aspects to this report is that one of the parents just took off right away and said, you know what, it doesn't matter what courses your child takes, standardized test scores are the only things that colleges consider in the admission decision. And of course, you could see me turning bright red in the corner. Yeah, no good. Uh, the counselors know yeah. where I work. So they, you know, they, they, were, they, were, you know, they were sort of holding their ground, but this parent was just unrelenting. And, and it stressed to me, it underscored to me, that for counselors and admission officers, because you guys are out there too, uh, facing all of this craziness, um, that this report is a really, a really useful, potentially useful point of triangulation. Uh, that you know, you might say, as a, as the counselors did, no, I don't think that's right. Well, that's that's your view. You know, I know the truth. Um, it's very helpful to distance yourself from your own institution, even, and say, but look, you know, here's a third, here's a third party that can tell you otherwise. So I think that that was a really interesting little bit that I picked up. Um, but in any event, just to cover a couple of other other things, and, and Chris, I know that this is, you know, we want to allow time for questions and answers. So um, just to touch on a couple yeah, of other highlights. I'll probably have to my own question here, so yeah, that's fine. Oh, sure, sure. Well, um, just, you know, again, just uh, to touch no, so, on. So, oh, go yeah. ahead. No, you're okay. No, you're in the middle of something. Go. Oh, well, I was gonna I was gonna launch into the other two bits, but if you had a question, please let me know. Um, well, I guess my, my question had to, I guess it was more of sort of a, an, another agreement point, if you will. That triangulation point, I think, is a, is a really good one because we see when we talk with students and parents one-on-one -on -one or we're out at the college fairs or we're doing a, a junior night uh, or we take phone calls from 
parents who were, who were saying, my kid's going to ninth grade next year, what math should he take? Um, and, and to sort of take that step back and say, okay, uh, you know, if you want to get into an Ivy League school, then that's one thing, but the small percentage of, of people who that impacts throughout the entire spectrum of secondary education, uh, to look at everything else that's out there, to compare yourself not to whatever the media ideal, I don't know, not, I don't want to dump on the media, but the, whatever the, the, the perceived ideal is for college enrollment uh, versus the reality of the number of options that are out there and uh, the, the ability of students to excel at any number of institutions and not just whatever is at the top of whatever particular ranking list you want to look at. That's right. No, I think, and I think you should feel free to dump on the media all you want. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no, I can't are, do that. You can do that. Are, I can't uh, do that. <laughs> there, there are some great and capable reporters out there, and I love them to death. But uh, there are also a lot out there who cut a lot of corners. And frankly, you know, uh, the story of college admission is something again that that this report tries to tell in a way that hopefully can punch through some of the noise. Because you're absolutely right. When you read about college admission in the newspaper, you're almost always reading about Ivy League admission. Uh, it's one of the reasons why we try to promote one of the key findings in our report. And we look at Department of Education data so that we have almost a complete picture of colleges, of four-year colleges in the U.S. Um, we look at the acceptance rates at all of these colleges and we average it together. Um, and the, the average acceptance, acceptance rate nationally is about 64 percent. So, you know, colleges overall are accepting two-thirds of the students. And, and you know, if you, if you know statistics, you know that an average is, is, a mid, is a measure of central tendency, which means there's just as many colleges on the plus side of that average as there are on the, on the minus side. So there are a lot, of, a lot more colleges that are actually accepting uh, most of the students who apply. And I think, you know, for, for, for the, the particular set of students that that's really important for, and this, this touches on some of, the, some of our contextual findings, is that's really important for the students who aren't currently served well by the system. Um, you know, when you think of, of students whose parents went to college, they're pretty sure they're going to get in somewhere. Now, they may still have some, some issues with sort of name brand shopping and, you know, and, and not finding the right fit, but ultimately they know they're going to go somewhere. Now, for the underserved students, I think it's critically important to say what you read about these crazies, and Bill Fitzsimmons at Harvard even describes himself as the lunatic friend, so I think we're okay <laughs> doing that. Um, to say, look, this is the, the truth is actually very different from this. You 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 can and will go somewhere if you want to. I know there's all sorts of questions about financing and and you know and, and costs that we don't get into in this report, but the basic facts, you know, I think when we look at things like early decision, early action, and wait lists, when people find out that only 20 percent of colleges in the U.S. have early decision to begin with, all of a sudden you get a different perspective on that issue. You think, well, we're then we're talking about a subset of colleges and and if then you ask, well, which colleges are you talking about? What types of colleges? Well, we, we drill into that, too. So I think that's another reason why that this, you know, this data can be so useful. Okay. So let's move along. Uh, where does, how does uh, technology play in have that you found? Well, you know, I think I was, I was going to start out by saying, you know, now that the, the digital dust has settled, so to speak, um, I found myself asking the question, well, actually, has it? Um, so probably not. But uh, having now done this for, for, again, more than a decade, there was a time when when we were all really playing with new toys in this in this technology area. So we we tried to take a look at the kinds of things that have, have been separated in terms of you know the really effective technologies and the not so effective. It probably won't come as any surprise that you know the website is the anchor. I mean that's you know that's 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 the view book. That's that's the anchor for everything else. So that's that's right at the top of the list. Um, what we found too is that social media is 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 right up there with it. Ten years ago, we were looking at things like chat rooms. Um, I was going to talk, flip through my notes here. Um, sort of online message boards, um, and I guess now we'd look back on this and think, well, how quaint and you know early two thousands. But at the time, there was a lot of energy invested in those things, and I think that they were probably intermediate technologies more than anything. Um, and we see now that that in fact m that most colleges don't use those anymore. Email newsletters, maybe about half of colleges use them. But social media really has sort of elevated itself up there um, as, a, as a key feature of, of most admission offices' um, offerings to, to students and families. But now, when we ask what are the most effective tools 
that's where it kind of gets interesting because you still have what I call the very hands-on uh, process of, of talking to students. And when we ask colleges what, what level of importance they would attribute to various uh, methods and, 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 uh, and uh, activities that they, that they used, um, we saw that 91% uh, of colleges said hosting high school students on campus was the most, Im most important thing that they do. Uh, very intense, very, very hands-on, very personal. The website came in second. Again, that's the anchor. That shouldn't be a surprise. The next two were email and direct mail, which is really interesting because everybody said email is dead. Um, maybe not as many people that say, say the funnel's dead, but, but a lot of people said email is antiquated. Um, but again, very personal, very direct, and very secure, not something that, you know, that, that's going to just be out there on, on some web page. Now the next four I thought were really interesting, and I'll just read them in order. Uh, contacts with secondary school counselors, uh, admission officer visits to high schools, college fairs, and then social media after those three. So I think it's really interesting that uh, you know, and one thing that I often have to tell the media about, because there is a lot of excitement about social media, and I think rightly so, but ultimately this is still a very person-to-person -person kind of, of enterprise. And that's something that we really feel is important for the students to hear, uh, and it's also helpful for, to reinforce for the admission offices if college presidents, for instance, are saying, you know, everything's on the web now. Just go do, you know, go do your stuff on the web. You don't need as many uh, recruit, recruiting uh, staff. You don't need to do this travel or that. It really is still a very uh, 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 hands-on kind of thing, and we wouldn't want admission offices to be without some sort of evidence to show uh, that, that they are still critical players in this, in this process. Very, very, very good points. I think it's interesting that social media fared as sort of low as it did on that list, that it's a, a full disclosure part of my responsibility here on campus, but even within that, I think universities that do social media well drive students through social media to those other things. It's, you know, here's a link to our tour schedule, here's, uh, you know, you, you've got really specific questions, call us or come in and, and bring a transcript and we'll talk about transfer credits or whatever. Uh, and for those who think email is dead, please don't tell my grad students who have to plow through about 200, 250 every day this time of year. It is decidedly not dead, I promise. Right, right. right. Well, and, and you make a good point. Um, as you'll see when the report gets released, I was reading off the list of uh, in order of considerable importance. When you add moderate importance, which you know, which which is is still very important, uh, you know, none of the, the the factors or the the activities that I read come in below eighty percent. So I mean, we're these are all very critical strategies. So social media right. absolutely is out there. You're you're absolutely right. It's the way. It's one of the primary ways in which students find uh, opportunities and make connections with admission offices, which is really important. All right. So, um, so what else? What other uh, data have you pulled out of the study? Well, the one the one area I haven't covered yet today is is the early decision, early action, and wait lists uh, section of the report. Uh, again, I did touch on the fact that only twenty percent of uh, colleges have an early decision program. I think that's important to note. Thirty two percent have an early action um, offering, and then forty three percent of colleges um, have wait lists. And uh, again, talking about the four year colleges here. And that really hasn't changed a whole lot over the years. But what has changed, and I find this kind of interesting, and there's just a couple of points. There, there may not be the most important or most critical, but they're just, for me, they're conversation points. One is when I look at, when you look at early decision, you would expect the yield rate to be up around 100%, maybe 90 And that's where it was for a long time. But we looked at it this year, and, and, and from, our, from our survey data, we came up with an 81.6% yield rate for EB. And I guess I have to ask, you know, I would ask professionals in the field, are you, you know, are you all actually seeing students defect in, in significantly larger numbers uh, than, than you would have been five or ten years ago? It would make sense in the context of the yield craziness that we've talked about. But I'm just, I'm looking at our data and wondering, can that be right? So I think that's, that's one interesting finding. The other that I would really focus on is um, the fact that it is now harder than it ever has been to get in off of a wait list. Um, we, this current year's uh, data showed us that the mean uh, percentage admitted off of a wait list was, was 25.4 percent. And that is down uh, quite significantly from, well, I didn't write that down, but it was, it was probably up around 40 percent about 10 years ago. 
Um, so that's a, that's a pretty significant drop, and it speaks again to the turbulence I think in the in the post May one environment or in the pre May one environment, the whole environment really. Can you? Um, we got a question on Twitter about yield, um, and sort of can you explain how yield works uh, in thirty seconds or less, and then I'm going to sort of follow up on that based on the. Yeah, I bet you could do it better than I could, but. Um, all right. Yeah, you're the yield. guest. I have, to, I have to yield to my guest. So yield is, is a number. Is all it is. It's a number. So That's a good in uh, it is. a numerical perspective, we look at, uh, and I'll, I'll use uh, Stony Brook as the example, we get uh, 30, 30,000 applications for our freshman class. Uh, we admitted last year 11,000 and change. We yielded a freshman class of 2,700. And so our yield percentage is that percentage of uh, enroll, uh, uh, admitted students who then enroll in the fall. It's a, it's a, a number that, uh, at least at Stony Brook, has, has grown the last couple of years. Um, but it varies uh, widely from place to place uh, based on the numbers that, that you gave us earlier. So yield, but yield is what really drives the bus at the end of the day uh, because that's space in classes, that's uh, scholarship availability, that's space in the residence halls, all those kinds of things. We need to make sure, as enrollment folks, that we bring in a class that fits uh, the spaces that we have available. And so we can't just say, you know, if we for some reason get a, a large number of applications for that, um, you know, for a particular major, for example, we need to be careful about how we read applications for our College of Engineering because there's a limited number of spaces in the College of Engineering. And if we bring in too many engineers, we don't have space in physics and calculus, and if we don't have space in physics and calculus, all hell breaks loose down the road. So uh, that's yield sort of in, in a minute uh, as to you know how that piece kind of comes together. Now my question for you, I had written it down and I lost it. Where did it go? Oh, that was the early decision thing. Um, and the, the, the wait list piece also. Considering that the wait list number has dropped significantly, I think that is really a factor in, 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 or should be a factor in how families are looking at the college admission cycle and the application process, not to just, you know, I mean, it feels like the last couple of years, and I don't know as much now, but the last couple of years when the number of applications per student really seems to spike, uh, to, to say, all right, let's do the research now and not apply to 17 schools, apply to five, apply to 10, and or apply to three, and, and ones that we've really kind of vetted and we have an idea, yes, we've got a good chance to get in, and then if we've got a good chance to get in, it's a kind of place we're actually going to enroll as opposed to just throwing out applications willy-nilly. My mom asked me 20 years ago, why didn't you apply to Harvard? Because I wasn't going to go to Harvard. So it, it wasn't going to get in either, but I wasn't going to go to Harvard. And so I saw no point at 17 in going through that process for something that there was no way I was actually going to do. And so I wonder if there's more, all right, yeah, just apply just in case. Uh, and, and see what happens, and then that's the domino effect of, you know, students who get in and then don't roll, and, and then, you know, multiple places, and double deposits, forget it. Don't get me started. Yeah, no, I think actually you've touched on the, the very phenomenon that I've tried to describe to anyone who will listen. Um, the media call me all the time and, and, and ask, why is this happening? What is, what's the problem here? And I do think ultimately that uh, we have been for the last 10 to 15 years in, in a kind of a self-reinforcing cycle where students have been submitting more applications per capita uh, every year. Uh, at the same time, to hear sort of the popular the conventional wisdom, colleges have been beating the bushes harder than ever because their yield has been going down as we've documented. Um, and the, the question I always ask is there a point of diminishing returns to this, both for the colleges and for the students? And th in this coming, uh, th this report that we're going to release shortly, um, one thing that we do see in the uh, applications per student, and we get that from the Higher Education Research Institute uh, American Freshman Survey out at UCLA, uh, for years the percentage of students who applied to three or more or seven or more uh, to colleges increased steadily. But in the in most recent year's data, both of those numbers went down by a, a percentage point or two. So I'm wondering, have students reached sort of a saturation point. They realized, well, it's too much work. Um, it doesn't make my decision any easier. Uh, it, you know, all sorts of things on a personal level that might make you consider, well, maybe I shouldn't submit as many. And then on the college side, it might be occurring to some colleges, well, maybe we should be focusing a little harder on the students who are more likely to 
enroll if they're accepted, and less on just beating the bushes overall. And in fact, that's I think for anybody who works in admission, that's exactly what's going on right now. Uh, conveying that to the outside world is, I think, important because it conveys to students that look, we're looking for messages. You're looking for messages. Let's let's get our signals, you know, on the right right track on the right page. Yeah, exactly. and maybe we'll reduce the craziness. I, I know that um, several colleges actually were were reported on in the media for making a deliberate effort to ratchet down their application numbers this year. So I do. Th I think you make an excellent point, and we'd want to see a few more years worth of data before we make conclusions. But I would absolutely not hesitate to say uh, that it's possible we could we could have point, passed a point of diminishing returns and could be hopefully headed towards a more stable environment. Because if you do tame those numbers a little bit, hopefully yield should stabilize and colleges won't have to sweat it out so much in the in the spring. Good point. So what is uh, what is NACAC looking at in 2014? What do we expect to see? Well, we have a few issues on our radar screen. Um, the, the, we've covered the yield rate question, the point of diminishing returns. That's something we're really going to be looking at from a data perspective. Uh, one thing that came up last year was, was, was transfer students. Uh, um, Inside Higher Ed did a survey of admission deans, and uh, they found that college, four-year college admission officers were really looking for transfer students, um, to probably to fill uh, retention gaps, but also potentially even first-year gaps. So. We're going to uh, we're going to be looking very closely at what NACAC can do for transfer students. We're going to be gathering data from counselors and admission officers about what they might need. Uh, we're also going to be looking at uh, the implications of the Supreme Court's decision in the Fisher case, and I think that's why those those data that we that we talked about with regards to person to person recruitment and and that hands on approach to recruitment. I think the students that colleges are going to want and need to reach out to to continue the the enrollment levels they need, but also to do sort of to, to fulfill the public mission of so many uh, both public and private institutions, uh, we're going to need to enroll more underrepresented students. And the, the Supreme Court and uh, the sort of punting that decision down a level and making the lower court um, sort of re-decide that case is going to give us some more guidelines, but I think if we all look down the road, our hands are going to be further and further tied on this issue. And I think those, those very um, hands-on strategies are going to become much more important. Uh, you mentioned international recruitment before, and then the last thing that I would that I would say is that the the environment for consumer protections is at a I, I think is at a place where admission offices are really going to start to feel it. Um, the president has talked about instituting a, a college ratings plan. Uh, there's all sorts of new uh, consumer tools out there, uh, and if you're not already getting questions about these things from students and families, you're probably going to in the next year or two. So NACAC will be trying to provide some guidance on those and, and more awareness about what they are and aren't. So those are really the top five things we're going to be looking at this year. All right. We have got to wrap up shortly. So, um, David, are any other final thoughts from you before we go? Well, I just want to, again, express my appreciation for you having me on. Uh, uh, again, if you, if you do want a copy of the report, we will be releasing the 2013 report shortly. The 2012 10-year trends report is worth a read, and it's on the NACAC website. Um, and I, I'm, my door is always open. The way we get um, questions for our surveys every year is that members send them to us. They say, you know, I'd like to know more about this. Have you guys ever measured that? So anyone who's watching has has any inclination uh, to, to send us suggestions, please do that. Uh, we'd be glad to uh, consider them as we move ahead. Fantastic. I definitely want to put a little plug in for uh, NACAC, and it's really a fantastic organization. It is us, folks. It's our professional organization on the national level, uh, and I know that the conference uh, is not something that everybody can necessarily go to for financial reasons or any number of things. Uh, that does not mean that you cannot be involved in the organization and in other ways, certainly be active uh, in discussions, check the web, uh, read the white papers, read the uh, see the presentations, uh, and uh, really be involved. And if not at the national level, at least at the regional level uh, as well, there are regional counseling uh, organizations that uh, bring incredible value to your everyday work. So uh, absolutely worth, worth being involved in, most definitely. So um, I want to thank once again uh, David Hawkins for uh, joining me this afternoon. Admissions Live uh, in 2014 will go live every other week. So we will be uh, 
on videotape. Uh, videotape? How old am I? Yikes. Uh, <laughs> next week, uh, and then we will go live again uh, in two weeks uh, on January 20th uh, with my uh, co-host, Nicole Lentini, who will be uh, talking about uh, other things that are in store for 2014. Uh, and as always, you can watch more shows from Admissions Pros on the Admissions Live archive at higheredlive.com, uh, as well as shows from all of my fantastic Higher Ed Live colleagues. Uh, we've got a, a fantastic uh, group of hosts this year. We are very, very excited for, uh, for lots of good things in 2014. Thanks to every one of you who've tuned in live and who uh, welcomed us on the, on the back channel. Uh, again, uh, hashtag Higher Ed Live. Uh, I am C. Dorso, uh, and David is uh, Hawkins Nackack. You can hit us up with questions anywhere along the way. Uh, and I bet we're going to have a really great year. So uh, thanks again, and we will see you next time on Higher Ed Live. <laughs>